Hi, I'm Jonathan Landsman with NaturalHealth365.com, and I'm here today with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez, thanks so much for joining us. It's always great to be with you, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me. You know, today we're going to talk about the ketogenic diet because in talking to Dr. Gonzalez, you know, it's obviously a, a big concern for a lot of people. A lot of people are very excited about it. They're hearing a lot of news about it, especially those people concerned about cancer. So, Dr. Gonzalez, before we talk about more of the details of the ketogenic diet, maybe just a quick overview. What exactly is it and why are people so excited about it? The ketogenic diet is basically a high fat diet, moderate protein diet that basically eliminates virtually all carbohydrates except a small amount that you might get some vegetables. Actually, it's kind of a retooling of the old Atkins diet. Atkins was famous as the proponent of the ketogenic diet for weight loss, diabetes, heart disease, and he would have all his patients on a high-fat diet, and they would be using ketone strips to check their ketones in the urine. Now, ketones, for those out there, are basically just breakdown products from fat that the cells of the body can use for energy. The body can use uh, sugar for energy, or it can use ketone bodies. And when you put people on a high-fat diet, the body will start using ketone body bodies, which are the breakdown products of fat. And that's the genesis, the essence of the ketone, ketogenic diet, whether it's the new version under Thomas Seafried or the old Atkins version. Both of these are ketogenic diets, high-fat diets with virtually no carbohydrates involved. There's a book here by uh, Thomas Seafring, who wrote a book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, which is right here. And also there's uh, journals as well. The Wellbeing Journal has just recently done an article as well about how exciting the ketogenic diet could be, right, potentially for cancer patients based on what you just said. I mean, it sounds like this diet will starve cancer cells to death. One of the bases of the ketogenic diet for cancer actually goes back to Otto Warburg, the very famous German scientist who won the Nobel Prize in 1931 for his work with cancer. He proposed that cancer cells use sugar preferentially, in fact, can only use sugar in their metabolism, that they can't use ketone bodies. They can't use fat to make energy. So the thesis of Dr. Seafried's book is if you put people on a high-fat, non-carbohydrate diet, you basically starve the cancer cells, which require carbohydrates and sugar in order to survive. You put them on a high-fat diet, he claims you're starving the cancer cells. So that's the genesis of the, ke of the ketone-based diet, the ketogenic diet, as it's called. So this sounds very exciting, obviously, but there are some concerns, aren't there, Dr. Gonzalez? Well, the first concern I have is there's really no data with clinical patients to support its use. Wait a minute. Let me just be clear about this, Dr. Gonzalez. So in this book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, talking about the ketogenic diet as like sort of, in a sense, the way to go, Thomas Seifring hasn't actually used it on a lot of cancer patients to say that this is the way to go? Well, first of all, he's a PhD, so he can't treat patients. But what astonished me when I read the book, and I read it carefully, I mean, new ideas are good. I'm always willing to learn. You know, I, I'll shut my practice down tomorrow if someone else is doing better work than I am with cancer, and I'll go retire and live on a beach somewhere. Uh, but what surprised me about this book is this all this enthusiasm from Seafried himself. It basically talks as if he has found the answer to cancer, which is kind of, a, kind of an interesting way to approach it. There are basically two cases in the book. One is a brain cancer. Well, there are several brain cancer patients in groups together, and talks about one patient who is also getting chemotherapy and as I recall, radiation at the same time, and had a 30 to 40 percent reduction in the tumor after several months, and he's talking about how extraordinary this is. The other case was a physician with multiple myeloma who two years out was doing well. Well, myeloma is a funny disease. It can be extremely aggressive. You know, I treat it all the time. I see very aggressive myeloma. Or it can be smoldering. In fact, there's a syndrome called smoldering myeloma, where smoldering means exactly what we think it means. It's slow growing. It's indolent. Patients can live five or six years before they even need treatment. So a two-year survivor of myeloma who's feeling pretty good and doing pretty well means absolutely nothing. In fact, if those were the two best cases I had, I wouldn't have written the book. Or I would have written it as a book of theory the way Warburg wrote, wrote his uh, papers as, book, as books and papers of theory, but not as a cancer cure. There's no evidence for that. There's laboratory, there's animal, there's cell culture, but there's no human evidence. The world is littered with great theories for the treatment of cancer that didn't work when they were used in clinical trials with real patients. In my own professional lifetime, there have been a whole series of such treatments that were such theories and such treatments that were promoted as the answer to cancer without any documentation. When they finally were put into practice, they didn't work. Now, the ketogenic diet, actually, as I mentioned earlier, is not new. Bob Atkins rose to fame 
using the ketogenic diet to treat weight loss. That's how he was primarily known. But he also treated heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes with the ketogenic diet. What virtually no one knows today is Bob Atkins also tried the ketogenic diet on cancer. In fact, he probably was the world's expert of the ketogenic diet treatment in cancer. And this is not something you read in a book or a newspaper or something, Dr. Gonzalez. You knew Dr. Atkins, right? He was a, a good friend of mine. I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I met him when I was a journalist in the 1970s and actually wrote about him very positively when he was being attacked about his ketogenic diet. After I finished my, when I went to medical school after being a journalist, as you know, and did cancer research, did my fellowship in cancer immunology. When I came back to New York, he actually offered me a job in his clinic. He wanted to set up a cancer clinic and he wanted me to head his cancer unit. He offered me a huge amount of money. It would, he said it would be nine to five work, and he wanted me in his unit. I was very grateful. It was very gracious of him to do that because I was untried. I just finished my training. But I turned it down because I don't want to work for anybody. I want to set up my own practice, do my treatment my way. And just to be clear, he was very excited at that point about something like the ketogenic diet for cancer patients, correct? Yeah, Bob was a multimillionaire. When he died, he left an estate of $350 million based on his diet work. He sold millions and tens of millions of copies of his books. But that wasn't enough. He was a very smart man. And Bob really wanted to take on the, the next challenge. And to him, the biggest challenge in medicine was cancer. And after I turned him out, he was going to show me that his ketogenic diet would be effective for cancer. And what virtually no one knows today, because he never talks, talked about it afterwards and never wrote a book about it, is that he treated thousands of cancer patients, putting them primarily on the ketogenic diet. And it really wasn't working too well. In fact, midway through that ex experiment in the mid-1990s, his IV nurse actually took me out to lunch and told me that he was so discouraged that he wanted to come join me and become part of my practice. And in about 1999, I had dinner with Bob. And he told me he was going to close down, he may have already done it at that point, close down his cancer unit. And I was stunned. He said, I'm going back to being a diet doctor. He said, I'm going to leave the cancer patients to you. He said, they're not responding. I've treated thousands of patients. We have hundreds of patients. Uh, we use different diets, as you know, but we have hundreds of patients with advanced cancer, including metastatic breast cancer, metastatic colon cancer, metastatic pancreatic cancer, who are alive 10, 15, 20, 25 years later with total regression of disease on a diet that involved large amounts of carbohydrates. In fact, the other day we talked about an old Dr. Kelly patient that I follow now. She was diagnosed in 1982 with stage 4 pancreatic cancer with metastases to the liver. The liver was biopsied, proven to be adenocarcinoma, the most aggressive type. The slides were read at the Mayo Clinic. The disease was confirmed. 31 years later, she's alive and well. And for five years, Kelly had her on four to six glasses of carrot juice a day. And carrot juice has vitamins, minerals, and trace elements, and guess what? Lots of sugar. If sugar fed cancer, if cancer cells thrived on sugar, if sugar were like gasoline on the cancer fire, she would have been dead in six to eight weeks like most stage four pancreatic cancer patients in that day. 31 years later, she's alive and well. And I challenge anybody, including Dr. Seyfried, to pull out of his own files a 31-year survivor of stage four pancreatic cancer treated with the ketogenic diet who did well and is alive and well. There is no such patient. I have a patient with stage 4 breast cancer who developed metastases in the bone while getting chemotherapy in 1987, one of my first patients. She's been drinking four to five glasses of carrot juice for 25 and a half years, and she's alive and well with all of her bone metastases gone. Those cases disprove his theory. Now, one thing about a theory, when you make an absolute statement that cancer cells thrive on sugar, sugar will be a suicide for a cancer patient, all, can all cancer patients, not some, all of them need to be on a ketogenic diet. If you have two patients that are eating large amounts of sugar in natural foods, like carrot juice, not white sugar, of course, but natural sugar, and get well, it basically contradicts his theory. These are the exceptions that disprove the theory. What would you say to those professionals about what they should be thinking about before they put something like this into play in their medical practice. Be critical thinkers. That's what being a scientist is all about. It's about critical thinking. That doesn't mean he, he's wrong, although I think he's wrong based on Atkins' experience with the ketogenic diet. This has already been done. That's the irony if people don't realize it, though. Look for case reports of appropriately diagnosed cancer patients who are alive 5, 10, 15 years later with poor prognosis cancer that you can't explain their survival except their nutritional program or whatever therapy they're doing. Then you might be on to something. And remember, the ketogenic diet is nothing new. It's already been tried. Um, you know, Blake Donaldson used the ketogenic diet back in the 1920s. Atkins used it, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and he tried to cure cancer with it unsuccessfully. But it's not a new thing. It's a new thing that's being rehashed. Be very cautious. Dr. Gonzalez, thank you very much for spending time. Thank you.